lose some people or wasn't that good enough yesterday? <laughs> okay. Um, this one is something relatively simple for the morning. Uh, at least it starts out relatively simple, it gets more complicated against the end. Um, but exceptions and distributed fault management. Some of these things start out very basic, and uh, I think I can go, can go over this relatively fast, uh, so that we can get to the more complicated stuff, the distributed uh, way of things. That is, for example, defining what exception management actually is. Um, even starting out to define what an exception actually is. Uh, I will do this very short. Compare then the concepts of transactions and exceptions. Um, and then how to deal with the case that we have multiple services, autonomous services, that do something like the, the, that we call business transactions. Something completely different, different concept from two-phase transactions as you know it from databases. So, um, my definition of exception is the violation of the semantic contract. Um, usually, if you ask people what an exception is, whether that occurs, uh, they say something unexpected. Um, it couldn't be more wrong. Of course, it is, is expected. Otherwise, you couldn't set up a cash handler and wait for it to something go wrong. But it is expected. Maybe you do not exactly expect when it goes wrong and what the exact type of failure will be. Okay. Thing is, exception is not an exceptional circumstance. Exception does mean from here we deal with our program, with our program flow in an exceptional way, in a different way, in a different matter. So we do not proceed the regular program flow, but we jump on somewhere else and continue also there. This is relatively complicated and um, most of the time, this uh, exception type that we have here in uh, .NET is called so-called structured exception handling. And yeah, it is structured like while loops and for loops are structured. As soon as you get something like the 16th level of structured event, uh, event handling or exception handling, it doesn't look as structured as you want it to be. Your code gets cluttered up with try catch blocks. We don't want that. If you look at it correctly, what happens when an exception actually occurs? What we do is a so-called exception stack walk. That is, we have our usual stack call stack, but we don't look at that call stack when we proceed with our exception. We proceed with the exception frame stack. The exception frame stack is built up using your try catch blocks that's building the exception frame stack. Of course, they are built somehow related to your call stack. But this is an intermediate relationship. There's nothing in between. Um, so, an exception that is actually this object, this thing that we actually get in our hands, occurs. Uh, that comes from several sources, you all know that. Uh, null references, file is not available, or actually you want to try to load code that is not verifiable or that is not valid. Um, then you get so somebody throws an exception at you. It can be the processor, division by zero, the processor exception, which is then translated by the common language runtime into your .NET exception as you get into your hands. It can be the CLR itself, it throws exception at you. It can be some library code, or actually you throw that yourself. Actively throw a new exception, and you're done. Okay, so then we walk up this frame chain and look for a handler, a catch handler that handles exactly that type of exception, or even more generalized. You all know that. And we have this second run where we look for all these finally blocks this very um, fine feature that allows us to clean up situations down at the latest call level before we leave it. A 
I think we all knew that. So, what's the term exception management? No an exception occurs. What to do with that? Okay, you better catch it. That's one thing. But then you have caught it. What do you do then? You try to proceed, most likely. If you have encountered an error, they don't let you succeed. For example, you try to load code that's not verifiable, uh, you can't proceed. If there's no memory left, you can't proceed. Because you can't even afford to get a, uh, a message box on the screen because there's no memory left to create that message box. So the only thing you can do is to try to shut down in a ordered manner and be sorry for the inconvenience. That's what you can do, the only thing you can do. Sometimes you can proceed. You just try to do something didn't work. And then you look for an alternative. Sometimes there is one, sometimes there is none. Usually there is none at that level where that exception occurs. Because there will be down in the gutter of all your code, there is an exception. Because you can open the file. What does that mean? I have to go a different route in my workflow. So that exception will bubble up, up to the workflow level usually. And there it can be solved. Only a few exceptions can be solved very closely to the place where you actually um, will actually occur. So if they occur down in the library, they will not be caught in the library. They will bubble up 17 levels and get to your code, to your workflow level, and then you have to deal with it. Sometimes you don't know what to do with it, with it so you shut down. And then you have this, sorry for the inconvenience. And then you have your customer at the phone, and they tell you something went wrong. And you ask him, what did you do? Uh, yeah, I tried to do this and that. And what does the program try to tell you? Um, I didn't know. It asked me to press OK. So I pressed OK, and the message box went away. And you don't have any information left what to do. So what can you do? You have to find out any information that is available for you, and what's left, maybe you get a memory dump, because it was a real crash. Maybe there's just that sparse information that you got from your customer that just pressed OK on that message box. It's very important that you not only detect that exception, but that you collect any information that is available at that point in time about the state of your program and put it somewhere for later retrieval. It's absolutely necessary. If you consider every situation where you have 35,000 clients, not all of you write programs in that field, but some of you will, um, some of these machines will die in every minute, more or less, if you have any problems, at least when your program is fresh. And if you collect all that information, you will have to uh, have external monitoring systems. You will not go to every single machine there is, 35,000 of them, and collect information from the disk. So you have to, logging that to a file or a machine is maybe a very bad thing. Or maybe just not enough. You have to log it in a central place, or just log it in a standard place that is reachable from a central location. Reachable by standard tools unless you want to write your own monitoring tool and all uh, information tool, it gets all that information together. So, I think I can skip a few things uh, that is, or just mentioning them, you get the slides in your hand and then you can read through it um, and see what we actually do is. Um, if you use it, um, exceptions yourself. What you should not do is indicate just desired scenarios. Like this scenario <laughs> I just count here unless uh, until my value here reaches the uh, threshold of 21 and then I throw an exception. What this basically is, it does work, um, I've seen this in code reviews and customers where the go-to was forbidden. This is a go-to just through the back door. I just jump where my cache handler is. It's a structured go-to, so to speak. 
C sharp only lets you do structured go to that is going up, not going down in the hierarchy. So it's essentially exactly the same. Don't do that, of course. Um, throwing exceptions is costly. So avoid them wherever you can. If you have a loop that throws an exception and does that in every loop, in every iteration, this loop will be very, very slow. Dealing with exceptions is actually optimized for the case that exceptions will not occur. So they should be really the exceptional case, so to speak. So that might uh, be um, involved refactoring your code so that you can avoid exception in that place, check before you enter the loop. Don't do try catches in the loop. Same thing. Um, creating objects might fail, especially if this object is a larger entity. Like, for example, I try to create a proxy to a service. That might fail that creation if the service is not available. If that service is a local entity, a lot of things are created. A lot of things can go wrong. If this is a remote thing, if a network is not available, if it times out, whatever it is, I get a problem. So creating objects might fail. If I just have a method like new, there's a rule. If you want to guard every single rule with a try catch, please go ahead and clutter up your code. Constructors should never throw an exception. Never ever. Because they are so often used in scenarios where you don't expect that this object is created. Hide these constructors, make them private, make, create instance methods and initialization methods that actually deal with that problem. That this might go wrong. Just for the sake of <coughs> being clear, cleaner code. Why not actually? Why not? Why not? The thing is, often objects are created on the fly by, say, um, oh, I'm just thinking of a scenario. Uh, no, for in Java you can. You can. No, you can technically. You can do this. You can catch an exception within the constructor. You right. could possibly catch the exception uh, around this new statement. But thing is, um, for example, you could create an object as a parameter, in a parameter call, on the fly. How could you guard that with a try catch? That's impossible. You would then guard that whole call with a try catch. Okay, you have to take care about it. Nothing else I said. But if the thing is, if you do all these try catches, how does your code look? Plus That's the it's problem. illegal as per the C sharp spec period. Pardon? It's illegal as per the C sharp spec. Yeah, but it's more or less a convention. Technically, it's possible, of course, but you better should not. Uh, term overcatching refers to this, uh, the case that the exception type that I actually try to catch is too general. That is, it is a base class of 20 or even more derived exceptions that I then use in my code. Problem is, uh, I have no specialized dealing with exceptions. Not handled exceptions, actually, that is exceptions that are, that are not handled in that case. They are derived from that base exception, but this is a very special thing, and I don't deal with it in that catch block. I would have to have a switch statement or something like this, or simulated switch statement, a cascade of if this exception type is that, then do this, if the exception type is that, do this, and so on. You could easily forget one. You just write a code, create a new exception, derive that from that base class, and that exception will never actually appear. You will never see an unhandled exception because it is handled. Handled in a way that it is caught by some catch handler, and therefore that whole exception treatment is seized, stopped. The exception is solved, so to speak, technically, but 
it was not really handled. We didn't do anything about it. It's just eaten up by your logic. It's too easy done, easily done. So try to catch exceptions, very specific. <coughs> For example, this one, you catch an I.O. exception, and the only thing that you actually um, expect here is that you do not find the file. If I have a different ex uh, exception, any other I.O. exception like uh, this, for example, is full, I get a message, file not found. And this is eaten up. I don't see it. The disk was full. It's not handled correctly. So only catch that particular exception type. As I said, try catches. You try something, you will never, most likely, handle that exception on that level. Most likely, several levels up. But what you have to do is, so try cache and actually grab. What's more often is, to try final statement. Of course, there will be try catches somehow, we'll have to catch the exception, no matter what. But try finally, makes your code more robust in the sense that I can clean up if something goes wrong, leave that field, this scenario, in an ordered way. I close all my files, I close all the things that I've opened, I clean up and um, <coughs> set pointers, whatever I have, and then bubble up to the next catch handler, then I deal with the exception itself. <coughs> Each level is left in a consistent state, which is very important because we get this go-to semantics in throwing an exception. And if you just jump across, jump across all these handling of dealing with cleaning up, will never be cleaned up. There is no way back unless you have these final statements. Yes, please. How does the code behave in terms of uh, method of order execution? Inside out. That just mean you have, um, oh, maybe I was too fast <laughs> when I got over this, uh, what is it? The stack walk. No, I mean the fact that if you, if you throw an exception, yeah. usually if I, if I have a catch, the catch will run first and then the finally. Now, if, if I, that's on the if same I level. do a, a try and the finally, that does the finally run before the, the catch node in a higher level? Yeah. For the bubbling. Yeah. Bubbling up inside out, that is, if the dead catch and that finally are on the same level of your nesting, the catch is executed first and then the finally. But if that, we are looking for the catch handler actually in that first run. If that is in the same level, I will execute it first and then the finally. If it is at least one level up, I will first execute, I will look for it, find it, then I will execute that finally statement, if there is any, on that inner level first, and then execute the catch handler, and then if there is a finally handler belong to that catch handler, this is executed. Okay. And uh, will and how are the exceptions cleaned up? If I go if I, if I go back to C plus plus the yeah. the old generation of C plus plus and uh, disposing of objects, someone needs to dispose of the objects and related elements like uh, connections. Let's say an error in a connection usually leaves the connection in a pseudo open method. Yes. So if it's I the same thing here. Okay. There's no difference. Hence, I said. Uh, <coughs> Write your finally blocks, your try finally, do something risky, open the connection, do something with it. If anything goes wrong, you will not catch that exception and handle it on that level. But what you have to do is bring a finally block, close the exception there, and then let the exception bubble up to the appropriate level, okay. to the next catch handler. There will be one. If you don't write it, uh, you get this message box, unhandled exception in which is an outright lie because somebody handled it at that moment. Okay. So that was that with the try finally. So first I look for a catch handler and, <coughs> and then I execute all finally handlers between the actual level 
and that cache handler. These are executed, then the cache handler, and then I continue just executing, and the next statement is the final block. I continue that final block on that level, and then you regular uh, executions continue. Um, if you, for example, consider the lock statement or the using statement that you have in C sharp, uh, that is exactly that semantics. <coughs> or even the finalizing method, if you write a destructor in, um, in C sharp, C sharp -like syntax, there is always a try finally. That's what the, uh, the, the uh, compiler does. And in the try block is what you give as your destructor. And then in the finally is a base finalized hook up with base class functionality. Because that has to be done. If your destructor code throws exception then, it just makes sure that the base functionality is called. Same thing with the lock statement. If you just enter a critical section, acquire a monitor, monitor enter on some object, and then an exception occurs, you will go past the exit statement. So no, nobody will release that object block. And then this is effectively locked forever. Nobody will ever release that. So you have to make sure that this exit, monitor exit, goes into a finally block. And if you use the lock statement, the compiler does that for you. <coughs> try, put the block of that lock statement in the try block, and then finally monitor exit. So that's what the compiler does for you. The same thing with the using, it calls dispose on that object uh, that is used here in the finally block. Adopt that pattern. It makes your code robust. It works, finally. There are rare occasions where it makes sense to catch everything, like this one here. It doesn't matter in the end what kind of error occurs. Sometimes you have to clean up in all cases. That goes into the final block. Sometimes we only have to clean up in the case of an error. <coughs> so that goes into a generic catch block. This, this is not a fault to do that. And then typically, you just clean up, you're setting the uh, index of something back to the original situ uh, situation, and then re-throw that exception. I don't say throw E here. So I don't catch exception E and throw E. Um, there's a slight difference between the two things. Catching anything and throwing anything, just the exception which is in that context, is re-throw just continues the exceptional processing with the same identical exception object is in the same state. <coughs> if you do throw E, the call stack is repopulated. The call stack, which is in that exception object. Which means then, it appears to you, and you, when you then finally catch that exception on some other level, it looks like the exception has occurred in this place and not in the original place, somewhere here in that method panel. So this statement retains that original call stack through E repopulates it. Yeah, when, when to catch exceptions at all? Only when I can solve the problem. Or, yeah, <coughs> that is actually, or I have to do clean up or I have to gather information that I can only get to in that context. As soon as I leave that context, that information of that context is obviously lost. So I have to put that in somewhere, most likely in that exception object, because this is shared between all these levels. This will go up. And the occurrence of exception has to be locked. We'll talk about this in a minute. So in the end, if you cannot solve anything, if you don't have to clean up anything, don't catch it. There's no use in that. Actually, it's counterproductive because you eat up that exception and nobody will see it. For example, Clement had this uh, thing, for example, there's this exception with this, uh, where he avoided, but anything, if anything goes wrong, just proceed. You can do that. In rare circumstances, and I think at the end of this talk, I will do exactly do that. Uh, catch anything and then proceed. 
might be useful because it's more or less expected behavior if something goes wrong. But you don't care about it. And what you then do with proceeding it actually reflects the fact that there was an error. Okay. Um, so what I can do, catch, recover, continue, if I can solve the problem locally, I can just ignore it, let it bubble up, let somebody <coughs> else take care of it. Um, so the try finally without the catch is just maybe clean up, but I don't deal with the exception uh, and solve it. I can catch it and re-throw it, as I show, and I can catch it rapid and re-throw it. And then it looks like this, exception, exception. Um, you catch A calls, B calls C. In C, somebody throws an exception. That original exception is caught within B. And then I do something with it. I add more information of the state about my whole circumstances here. And I put this information into um, or indicate that state by a new exception, a wrapper exception. It's usually of a different type of that original exception here. This is a very specialized exception. I'm not interested in that particular specialized exception. I'm interested in a more general thing. I just want to have an indication that something went wrong. I don't, know, I don't need to know what really happened, or just for logging purposes maybe, but I'm interested in something went wrong, a more general exception. And that leaves me with the opportunity just to catch this wrapper exception, have one catch block for a multitude of exceptions, but have all of these original information available because I've just taken this exception and stuck it into that wrapper exception as the inner exception object. And then augment that except outer exception with some more information and let it bubble up and catch it there. Makes things a lot easier. Um, there are guidelines how to define your own exceptions. You should be very careful with creating new exceptions. The problem is with each exception that you, exception type that you define, you introduce a new field where you have to have a well-defined catch head of this particular exception. So. If you have only 10 different exceptions that can possibly occur, fine, I will have 10 different cache handlers. If I have 100, I have to have 100 cache handlers. It doesn't make things easier. If there is already a type of exception available that indicates more or less what you want to say, use it. You have to have a real reason to introduce your new exception type that you use. Reuse existing things. Put particular information then into that object. There is there are slots available where you can put a lot of information into it, and that's completely sufficient. Uh, but if you actually do that, then follow the rules. Not even the framework follows its own rules. The rules say you got to have at least four, not at least exactly four constructors of different types for different scenarios. At least one, for example, to have a remotable uh, exception, so that it can be used in a remote scenario. If you forget one of them, the exception might not be created in, in that way that you want it. And that can be very nasty, so follow exactly these rules. Most exceptions in the framework look exactly like these rules defined, not all of them. So, Make sure that you find one, one of them with a four constructor. Okay, then you have actually find your exception, and you throw that in a correct way, or somebody else throws that at you, and what you do then? Okay, I solve a problem locally, but does that solve the problem in a real sense? Maybe you should look at your code that you have, or uh, and changing so that this exception doesn't appear all the time. 
<coughs> if you have, sir, have you, uh, there are a lot of programs that actually creates an exception at any, more or less every day, but every time a certain functionality is called. And you solve that problem then somehow in your program by just creating a different <coughs> route, going a different way. Why have this logic at all? Why not change the code? Why not do that different route in the first place? And save some time and make your code run faster and more reliable. Yeah. So you at least can learn about that something happened. So no matter whether you, this problem could possibly be solved or not, what's absolutely important is the error must be locked. You have to write that information, that the error occurs, with all state information that is available somewhere. Of course, especially in the cases where you couldn't solve the error, because then action is immediately needed. The operator has to kick in and add a new disk, or delete some files, or <coughs> give you more security uh, permissions, because you could not access something. Things that can be changed by the operator or the developer, which has actually changed the code. There's always one exception that you will not catch in your regular workflow. That's just Murphy's law. So you have to set up a, or make sure that the exception will never reach the outside of your scope. Never ever. Because what happens, it just the exception reaches the utmost level and nobody cares about it, this thread will die. The downside of it is, uh, with framework 2.0, is not only that this thread will die, because there is a change in framework 2.0, towards 1.1, that it's not just the thread just dies a silent death, it tears down the whole application domain. They did change that because of uh, now SQL, SQL Server can host C sharp, uh, the CLR, and you can write your uh, store procedures in C sharp. And if something goes wrong in a store procedure, you better roll back the whole transaction. But if a threat dies just a silent death, nobody will notice it because exceptions are not marshaled from one thread to another automatically. There's no way. They have to change the runtime in a way that if an exception reaches the utmost level of any thread, it just dies. It just tests down the whole application domain. And then make sure that the whole transaction then is rolled back. So some design patterns that you have, um, that you just start a thread, and if that dies, who cares? My main code will continue, will not work in the framework to all. So you have to make sure that you catch every exception. But sometimes it still doesn't work. So you're going to have a cache handler on the utmost level and try to catch everything. But sometimes you cannot continue anyways. And therefore, there we have this unhandled exception handler. This is just for famous last words, nothing more. Because <coughs> if this exception handler is called, the threat is due. And under 2.0, that means the application is due. It will die, but you have a last chance to clean up things. You have a last chance to write anything to the event block or wherever, and to inform the, uh, the operator in a decent way, convenient way, sorry for the inconvenience. But then the application will die. Unless, what you can always do is, in this unhandled exception handler, you just enter an infinite loop. The application will never die. And um, for example, some applications, <coughs> you have them, they, they hang, and then you open up Task Manager, and you try to kill them. And you need to kill them twice. Because what they do is, they just catch this thread of ward exception that they get, and enter a new loop. And then you hit them a second time, and uh, yeah, and that just depends who does this more often, entering a new loop or shooting at him. 
um, <laughs> one or the other wins. So that's the reason why I have to kill most programs twice. So, exception reaches the utmost level, cannot get all information that you have, persist this information no matter how, may it be synchronous, may it be asynchronous, uh, because you have all the time in the world, send notifications somewhere, because just storing the information somewhere in a secret place doesn't help anybody. You store the information into the event log. How often do you look into your event log? Usually you should do that every single time, every time. You do that if something went wrong and you see that. But do you all do you see all these errors? For example, this same procedure that you do here, you do with all the exceptions that are gone, not only there are those uh, that actually lead to this unhand exception handler. Persisting the information, you do always. You have to log it. Yeah, and then it sits there in the event log, fine. Nobody looks at it. So <coughs> it sits there and two weeks later you scroll down because you find out there was something going wrong. There was a wrong invoice something sent somewhere. Why is that? And this occurred now for the second time or the third time. And then you see there was an error. This exception was caught, it was even locked. But that's it. And then we proceed. So you get a have somebody look at it, so you send a notification somehow. Uh, and then, of course, in this case, you clean up and then uh, be sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, this is just some of things that you have to log at least if you can get more information about local variables or uh, <coughs> global variables, who cares? Store it all into that log. It may be of use. If not, Okay, nothing is heard, but you have all the time in the world, even error occurs. Don't try to save time in this. It, it's counterproductive. The application may need that information itself. That's rare. That the application then reads through that log, reads through that information, and tries to continue from there. <laughs> just to find out, okay, this happened. We were in that state. Then we have to proceed this way. It's possible to do that. Rare. The user needs information, maybe how to get around that problem, or maybe how just information like the police caller administrator that gives you more rights, something like this. Um, the developer to fix the problem, or the operator exactly to uh, yeah, just plug it in the disk or something like this. Where to put that info? A uh, lot of possibilities, for example, the Windows event log advantage is always there. It's reliable to an extent that if that doesn't work, nothing works. So why care? We will not reach anything. Programming against the event log is just three lines max, opening up a new event log even included, um, storing that information which is stored in that exception object then into that event log. Very, very simple. You get a good integration with WMI. You will see in a minute why this is so important. Um, and many users actually know what the event log is. Administrators should know that. And most users know what the event log is. At least they can be taught to use that. Because it's always there. It's Windows standard. It's not a special thing. You'll find it on every machine. This thing is a standard logging method, which means it's not always that your program actually, that your code causes the error. Somebody else caused the error or something unrelated, intermediately related thing caused the error, and your error is just the follow-up error. You want to synchronize, you want to see how does it relate to other problems. And if all log into the same place, then you can see at least in the, in the necessity uh, in, the, in the neighborhood of your, uh, your logging entry, you will find other entries. Not necessarily the first error is logged first. There's some asynchronicity here. 
And um, if you have a distributed system, the error might be even locked on a different machine. You can open up the event lock on a different machine and then try to consolidate that input. Errors on that machine, errors on that machine, and then consolidate these two things. You see, okay, this was the original order of the errors. Of course, clocks are not always the same on all machines in the network. So there's some latency involved. Some machines are faster, some <coughs> machines are slower. If they have a problem, they might be very, very slow, so logging is deferred. But at least you get an idea that there are other errors which caused the problem to start with. Storing to a central location has the advantage that you have all the information already in one place. You don't have to consolidate yourself. Problem, there's a network resource. If you have a network problem, it's not as reliable as the local event log. Still, you have the option to just have a fallback strategy. If I can't reach that central place, I can still log locally. Um, problem here, if I do that in a central database, synchronization with other events is then more difficult because they are then stored only in the event log or in a other third party tool, which makes it very difficult to find out what happened first. Smaller setup, but still 
they'll have some kind of notification. Um, you could stick to messages using email, just sending an email somewhere, which of course means that you would better have, better have a uh, web server, a uh, FTP server, uh, service around. That's not always available. Uh, and email is not exactly uh, what is reliable. And if you get an email every two seconds or even more often, nobody will look at it. So you have to make sure that you only then send emails for the real serious cases and not for everything. Because informa the more information that you have, the less information that you have. If you really want to, you can write your own custom certification system. Um, yeah, I think that's clear. Uh, collect information from all the sources that you have, uh, where you have locked your information to, and then send all these information to whoever is concerned. Uh, that's the task of such a tool. If you have a not so expensive solution, but that is distributed, that is an option to spend a few days on something like that. Must be the deluxe version. Must not be. Uh, doesn't have to be. But it's better than just having messages in the system and nobody looks at it. For a start, once again, message queuing. <laughs> just drop a message in a message queue and have a tool collect these messages from that public queue. <coughs> Read from there. It's as simple as it is. And then send notifications like email, like you know, some tappy interface, and uh, use a page phone or whatever. Relatively simple. Exception to thread local thing, I've already said that. Uh, they will never reach a, uh, the, the main thread, or the parent thread, I should say. If you use asynchronous delegates, that's a more elaborate schema, uh, they actually already implement a relaying pattern of getting exceptions from one thread to another. Because if you just do a begin and on it on a delegate that is created, then a thread pool thread is used. Uh, but before that work item is actually filed, there is an automatically built method around that work item, which catches that exception <coughs> if anything occurs. And does, does nothing else but grab in that exception and stick in it into that ISAC result structure that you get as re, uh, the return value of that beginning invoke. If you then call any invoke on that structure, that exception is rethrown automatically. And if you then call any invoke from the parent thread, that means the exception now occurs on the parent thread. You can do that yourself. If you do manual uh, thread management, like thread start, thread join. But asynchronous delegates already implement that. <coughs> uh, no, I will not do it today. Um, how final is finally? So is that thing that actually <laughs> uh, <laughs> Watch out for possible exception in the final blocks. I can go into a final block and I want to make sure that everything is executed in a final block. There's a reason for being there. And what happens if I have an exception in that final block? Uh, it happens the same as always. We just leave that context, bubble up to the next uh, exception frame, <coughs> leaving things in an inconsistent way. That's how it is. So you better make sure that even no exceptions occur in that final block. Or that you actually, if you do more than one action that possibly throws an exception at you, better guard them with a local try catch. Or better, better try finally. So in the end, if you have more than one statement in the final block, it always looks like Try, do this, finally, try, do that, finally, do the third thing. <coughs> That's how final box should be. <coughs> uh, 
Um, yeah, and you always have to be aware that somebody might throw a threat of war exception at you at any time. A threat of war exception is something special. <coughs> you can catch a threat of ill war exception, but you cannot solve it. Which means, after catching, after the catch handler of a threat of war exception, the exception is automatically rethrown. And we bubble up until the utmost level. Unless you enter that infinite loop, as I already described. So somehow, we could consider this as, I make sure that I enter a certain state, and if something went, goes wrong, I will leave it in a consistent state. I can clean up. I can reverse what I already did, or I could uh, make sure that we leave in a consistent state. So that looks a little bit like transactional. But this is strictly local. And with all the problems <coughs> that we have already uh, discussed, like I have to have really catch handles around each single <coughs> line, so to speak, in order to accomplish that real transactional behavior. This is something that you don't want to do. Nobody does that. And still, it wouldn't help. Yeah. <coughs> So if I only talk about a single target that I modify, that might be true. If I have a distributed system, that will not be true. In a distributed scenario, usually, you have things like, for example, web services. And now there's something like, <coughs> should an exception ever leave my scope? If I have a problem in my local logic, say, find out found exception. Is anybody interested in the problem that I have, given the fact that I am a service, an autonomous unit? I'm used in a <coughs> anonymous scenario, so to speak. <coughs> and this is quite simple. Exceptions will never leave my scope. Sometimes you see these web pages where you uh, just try to do something on that web page, and all of a sudden you get that message, um, SQL error in, and then you even get that uh, statement, SQL statement on, on the web page. Uh, let's return. This is, of course, a very bad thing. Nobody should ever know that you have problems like this. You don't want to know it, have your customers uh, look at your wrong code. Very bad. And in the end, the guy is interested in your personal problems. It's your thing. He's only interested in it works or did not did not work. It's the only thing that you actually have to return. So you have to return something like, yes, I did my work, or sorry, I couldn't do it. Maybe give some hints how to proceed, but in the end, he's only interested in I couldn't do it. Because I will only be part usually, of a larger transaction, of a larger thing. And if I fail, most likely the whole thing will fail. So that has effects on other things. If I just die, that's bad. So I have to make sure that I catch all my internal exceptions. And I don't want to convey that, that ex so exceptions to somebody else. And so that they, these guys have to build, try catch around the web service call, um, something I don't want to do. Um, so I just deliver a return value, which indicates, sorry, unsuccessful. Maybe some additional information, not necessary. So we have to try to find other things. <coughs> Talking about these differences here. Having more than one target, what's the problem with that approach then? If I do the try, I call the do method on all of these things. That's one thing. That's one thing that could possibly happen. I could call do on that first target. Didn't work. And then I might have to call fix on that target. because. I am controlling that whole thing. That means that doesn't clean up necessarily by itself. I have to tell, okay, uh, 
You did something. Please now try to get into the original state. Fix that problem. Whatever that means. Next thing. The problem occurs when I call the second one. And then I have to call fix and fix on those, these two. This, actually, that is interesting. This is already done. So I will call fix after the fact. Just make a note of that. Here, on the do, the problem occurs, which means fix might even be empty. Nothing has been done. That's different. And then I have the fourth uh, case where the problem actually occurs under Z. <coughs> In look structure, the problem is I have the uh, a magnitude of execution paths which grows by the number of the involved objects, whatever the objects might be, or services, whatever it is. Um, you want to test all that. If you have more than these three, say 250, have fun. You don't want to do that. Uh, this is how the code then may look. Well, actually, I think that here is a uh, problem on the slide. So don't look at that too closely. It already looks ugly. That, that you can see here. Nobody wants to have that. And I have more problems here with that approach. And that is, if X did something that cannot be reversed, how do I proceed? If the action X was actually, I have sent my uh, cancellation <coughs> to my boss, if I already have done that, and then in my second task that I do, like I want to sign a new contract with my new employer, that does fail for whatever reason, um, I have a problem. Because this is already done. I end up without a job. I don't think that that will be reversed somehow. That fixed operation is um, maybe not that pleasant. If I can only do X, if Z will also succeed, if that only makes sense if that succeeds. Or, this is actually then coming back to that first problem, uh, if my boss has already read my letter, um, there is no fixing things. But I, there's no way in getting back to the original state. That's why some people invented two-phase transactions. <coughs> transaction. Which means, in the first loop, I only call prepare on all the participants in that transaction. In that case, all of these participants are enlisted into my transaction. What they do in the prepare phase is, they look, can I possibly do that? If you asked me to do it, would I be able to do it? And if I say, yes, I would be able, that is a promise. That is even a holy wow. The whole system would fail, it would not work, if then if there is a chance that this actually doing the thing would fail. Most be, uh, Mostly this is implemented like doing the thing already in prepare. <coughs> so that you make sure that it will work. But keeping it somehow separate from the others. Nobody else can see that. And then in commit, I release that result to the public. That is then what happens if all these prepares actually succeed. I can't commit on all the participants, make all this published and be done. If one of these actually fails, one of these prepares, I call a board on all of the participants and I roll back everything. I just forget what I did. The difference in that exception handling scheme that we first had, it's better that all do's work. Because if anything goes wrong, I'm in a big, big mess. Because it could possibly be that I cannot get into the original state. 
and cleaning up things which have already been <coughs> done can be very, very difficult. If there's only one tool, that's fine, that's what we do. And, uh, it, or if that number of um, do's is very, very small, <coughs> and if the things that I do are more or less reversible, then this is just fine. This distributed transaction approach, that actually doesn't matter whether this works or not. The programming model is exactly the same and very, very simple. I just call prepare on the participants, and then I call the board or commit, depending on the outcome. Um, that requires, of course, that these promises are kept. That can be very difficult to manage to do that. Uh, it's not only about locks in a database. That's one thing, how to accomplish that. That I just sit on that data and say, this is now mine for the run of this transaction. And if somebody calls commit, I just release that lock. Nothing else is done. And the board, I just roll back and do anything to get into the original state. And nobody's affected. <coughs> not exactly true, nobody is affected. Because if somebody else wanted to get to that data while I'm sitting on it, that guy has to wait, obviously. Because and he's not allowed to look at that data, not even allowed to look at it. <coughs> so he will have to wait until I'm done. And now I get a second problem, that these protocols may block. <coughs> Distributed scenario. So all of these guys that are actually working together with me, they are more or less cooperative. And they are on a more or less long leash. <clears throat> so I have no direct control over them. And if they just say, okay, I will play with you, they can't prepare on me. And then they say, yes, I will do that. And then I can't commit on them, and they get no answer. I have to wait. I have to wait until this guy tells me, <coughs> yes, I did. Because I never know whether what happens with my commit in a distributed scenario, unless I have something like reliable messaging in place. Because I don't know what happened with my commit message. Did it receive the other side? I have no receipt for that. Did you receive it? Was just receipt intercepted or went elsewhere? I don't know. So I have to wait until that other guy actually says something. I cannot even just say, okay, after 10 minutes, I will just report. If that guy has committed and my receipt got lost, that guy did something and all the others rolled back. So I, I'm sitting here. The only thing I can do is wait. That's bad. It's particularly <coughs> bad in the internet scenario where you have some people who want to play with you or have fun with you by just participating in a transaction they're refusing to cooperate. Effectively blocking systems. This is, it's not only that the coordinator is blocked, all the participants are blocked because they will not get, their, if this, this participant who blocks actually or does not cooperate, is one of the first to get a commit statement. How do I proceed? No sitting there. Coming back to us, services thing. Services are autonomous, they are boundary around state, their own state. We'll never get to that state. I can send messages there and I get messages back. This asset transaction boundary around several services or objects, I should say here, is what I just explained. <laughs> asset, the, um, no, not tenants, these are just the properties of a two phase commit transactions. It is atomic, consistent, isolated and durable. Um, important here, especially, uh, okay, consistent, which means 
I, I start from a consistent state and release the system in a consistent state. Atomic is quite clear. It is one action more or less. All or nothing happens. Durable, that's the least important. If I have done something, it's really done and it's persistent. Change it out. And then isolated. Very important. As long as the change in these states are going on, <coughs> nobody else can get to that state. Because while this transaction is running, this is all preliminary state. It's not yet done. Nobody should look at that. <coughs> because I, in the start, it's consistent. In the end, it's consistent. Here in the middle, <coughs> it may be inconsistent. But this is actually not how things work in business. When you usually work together, have your regular process, business process, when you do things. You can't put a hard lock in a database that doesn't belong to you. If you order a book, and our sample that I'm having here is, we order three things from different places. That is, I order a flight, I order a hotel, and I order a car when you go somewhere. Uh, we do this not on our own. We have a travel agent who does it for us. Now he's sitting in front of his terminal and working with all of these guys. Flight agencies, hotel agencies, and with the car agencies. And he looks at the flight, and then he looks at the car agency and the hotel agency. Maybe even overlapping. Of course, we don't do a two-phase grid transaction across these borders. We have different approaches there. We just described how that then actually would look. What we do here is, we try to do things, we try to order all these things, these three things, hotel, flight, and uh, car, and just check, could we do it? Was it, was it really, did it happen? And if yes, we are already done. If not, yeah, we give back the things that we have already uh, accounted for. We would have to compensate. Okay, I order the flight, I order the hotel, I order the car. I didn't get the hotel, so I can get rid of the car and get rid of the flight. And usually, that's not possible. I have already booked a flight. And if it was economy, now they say, please pay us $40 for your reservation, pay just a reservation fee. So I'm not in the original state. I lost $40 and they made $40. So that is not rolling back. The car, most of the time you can get rid of it like, like a roll back in that sense. Most of the time, not necessarily. The consequences of such an approach is I don't have to put hard locks on something. Why? This is already uh, booked, this flight. <coughs> okay, it is booked, it is done, and we can proceed from there. It is like this was the only action that happened. For this car, uh, flight agency, business is done from their perspective. So they don't have no reason to hold locks. If they want, if you want to have something like locks, do things like I want to reserve that flight. They ask for a fee because when you go business class, it's much more expensive. So you have to pay for that lock for a reason. <coughs> that the board thing here can get very very complicated. It's only one thing like okay, I, I. Get back, uh, I give back my reservation on the flight. Fine, it's relatively simple. But it can be very, very complicated. Because who knows what has already been done behind that? They have, may have already ordered the meal. They might have already done things like uh, <coughs> to one other customer, other good customer, and have to send them away because the uh, seat was not available. Things like that. And you have to reverse these things. Difficult. But still, in distributed models, 
will always work like this. <coughs> Problem, it gets complicated again. Not necessarily I get to the original state, because not all actions are reversible. Uh, <coughs> say we just fired a um, cruise missile or to Moscow or whatever, that's not reversible. Only thing you can do is apologize. <laughs> which is actually not really a rollback. Um, we have this uh, atomicity, more or less, <coughs> you can say, because we can compensate some things, something we cannot really compensate. But we will remain in some consistent state. That is something we make sure. But definitely we're not isolated, because intermediate results can be seen and used and altered the others. But that's how it goes. Different approaches here. First approach is this uh, sort of saga. Saga is a long story. One thing after another. So a serial transaction. So I think we can go here. That is exactly what you have already explained. I book a flight and get it to stay well. I book a hotel and get into state two. Note that these things are already committed to their respective data state. Book a car and commit. That's fine. If that all works, and usually it works, that is the base assumption. Usually it works. But that's how business goes. Usually business works. <coughs> Sometimes it doesn't work. Here, for example, the problem with my car reservation. Now, I have to look at it. I have a chance to look at it. I'm going back to state two. Sitting here with a flight and a hotel, but airport and hotel are too far away from each other, so I haven't got a car, so I better return that hotel, cancel that, cancel the flight and stay at home. That's one option that I have. Next option that I have is Okay, I cancel that hotel, just book a different hotel close to the airport, then I don't need a car, and I'm done again. So that leaves me with the option to go different routes in my workflow. It's basically a state machine. That's your problem here. Um, things that you will actually easily develop <coughs> using tools like this door. Only one transaction, minor transaction, is active at a single given point in time. Um, there will be no blocking. These three actions will not block each other. Definitely not, because they are independent of each other. This general transaction coordination like they all have to enlist into some central place is not needed. Your single program based on workflow or the single program that you write, uh, here maybe for this, but this one is not needed, <laughs> but single workflow is easily done. You don't need to read transaction code yet. And you don't have to exchange transaction tokens and the like with all participants. Yes, as I said, we can already shape the control flow uh, by just going different routes. If something doesn't happen, okay, go elsewhere. <coughs> but in this approach, it's only one action at a time active, which means serializing things is always slower than doing things at the same time. With that two-phase commit approach, I can just fire all my prepare statements to all participants and then sit and wait so all these prepared statements come back to me. But then I just look at all these results. All were true, everything happened, fine. And should commit statements to all participants at the same time. I could possibly do that same thing with, with this compensation approach as well, but it's a little more difficult. Um, no asset guarantee with that compensational approach. <coughs> and then, in real life, we're something like, something in the middle. 
this reservation thing. That is how business is mostly done, for example, or really done when I try to do this uh, booking of a in a flight agency. I reserve a flight for two days. If I come, don't come back for them within these two days, they just release their reservation. So this is all done in good faith, so to speak. They do that just for you. There is no lock in the database. They just make an entry into that database that this is a reserved entity. And then they get their hands off the database and it's still again open. Everybody can work against this. And if then somebody tries to book a flight <coughs> holding a senator card, uh, they will just release that reservation and book that flight for the senator. So it's not guaranteed. It's actually not a real guarantee, no. Uh, in real life. You can also say this is a hard reservation. It will not be released for two days. That's just how the business goes. Uh, okay. Can you tell the, uh, you know, I can only tell that story. <laughs> Which story? Hard, hard, if, if we have some transaction fundamentalists here, um, <laughs> they'll be a little irritated. So, let me see. Is that? One, two, one, I four. One, I four. <laughs> Um, transactions uh, transactions is, is a topic that's very close to my heart, so I'm not really sure why Achim is talking about it. Um, guarantees, in, guarantees in the world of transactions are something that is, you have assets, and that makes everything very easy, right? But that's a and that's a fairly good guarantee. But in, in reality, doing assets uh, in distributed systems is really difficult. Um, it turns out that... Um, very many systems do not give you hard guarantees, but they try their, they try very good to, to make guarantees work. They, they don't give you 99.999% reality, but they, they gamble against the odds that things go right. Take, I know we have someone from, from El Al here, um, which is, I said yesterday, I said, insurances are uh, legalized gambling. So are airlines. Airlines gamble against the odds that someone will not show up for a flight. So what they have is they have uh, you know, high buildings, and the upper half floors, upper half of the floors, are full of statistics people, right, mathematicians, and all they do is calculate the odds of how likely it is that everybody's showing up for that flight. Um, they have very sophisticated programs, and with you can you can see how sophisticated they got because there's an, a decreasing number of airlines which which require you to reconfirm flights 48 hours before you fly, right? That's going away gradually because they are able to do this without you reconfirming because they have the mathematical models in place. So if you go up to if you go up to an airline and say I want to have a seat on that plane, they will give you one, right? Capacity of for that specific route is 130 people on that on that plane on the given day. This is what they've pre-scheduled. 130, they're going to sell 150 seats on that plane because they know that on that given day, due to, to circumstances, there's some events going going on, etc. On that given day, statistically, over time, there have been 20 people can, canceling or not sure, or being no shows. Their goal is to be their goal is to be uh, full to the seat and have nobody left behind, and that's what they do for statistics. So they will give you they will give you a res reservation even though they know um, that n that not all of the 150 can be fulfilled. If there's if there's um, unanticipated demand, they can of course change the airplane, right? But that's the last. That's the last measure. That's basically what they're pulling from reserve. Same thing is the guarantee that you get. So with aircraft, that's something that's booked in advance and where the planning is is, is well more predictable. They know what they do and they they have a limited number of, of airplanes. 
Um, if you look at the car business, here, hotels or cars, if I call up the, um, the hotel we're currently staying at, the Dan Tel Aviv, uh, if I would be calling them up and say, I need to have a room in six weeks, unless there is a major event happening in town, like a trade show or anything that fills up all the hotels, um, they'll say, okay, yes, sure. Because <laughs> they're, they're un the uncertainty of people showing up for a hotel room is much higher than for an airline. They have, they have a little bit of an overview of how many people will be there given the season, but it's much less certain. With cars, with rental cars, there's no certainty whatsoever. All the reservations for them are really uh, only used as a planning, as a basis for planning. They have no idea whether they're going to have cars in six weeks. If they won't have cars in six weeks, they can also move cars around the country and make sure that you have one. For them, it's not, this is not a limited resource, right? And even if it is a limited resource, they can't give you a hard guarantee. It's possible that um, you know, a station here in Tel Aviv has currently 12 cars they have on site, right? And they rent out all the 12 cars and all 12 cars get trashed in a day. So here you are with your guarantee because you know the next day people come in and say, oh, there's a problem. I was in Marrakesh, that's, that's the little story and then I'm gonna be done. I was in Marrakesh two, well last year um, for a conference, in, uh, for Microsoft conference. And um, so we had a car reserved. We, want, we go to the Avis station. We, I say, here's my reservation. I want to have a car. And the guy says, no. I'm like, what? Well, you know, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia is in town and rented all cars. So we don't have any anymore. And I said, but I have a reservation. He says, well, that's so. Apparently, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia has a little more to say in Marrakesh. Um, so he, rent, he, he rented all the, uh, all the cars. It turns out he owns half of Marrakesh. So that's, that's the thing that uh, is quite natural. But, but that's a real story that happened to me where I was quite stunned that uh, um, they wouldn't honor reservations at all. It was just, you know, the guy is here and so rented all cars and that's it. So these are, these are, none of these are hard guarantees, and these are different qualities of guarantees. This is a guarantee which is, which is backed up by statistics and is also backed up by law, right? In the EU, for instance, the, air, the airlines have to pay huge fines if they overbook flights. Here, it's more a, it's a, it's a, diff, it's a, it's a limited resource also, but it's a matter of, more a matter of planning and guessing, and the closer you get to the date, the more it becomes a resource allocation thing, and here it's really only a planning device. Um, but none of these are really hard guarantees. None of these things are done in, asset, in an asset mode. Because you don't want to deny someone because it turns out that at this given point in time, all the 160 seats are taken because you know that someone is going to cancel. Sorry for the interruption. Oh. <laughs> It's your time. <laughs> In the end. Um, actually, that really works so well. I one was a victim of exactly that uh, when I tried to go to, uh, to Los Angeles and, and uh, showed up in Frankfurt way. and uh, said, sorry, overbooked, because there were more than uh, the calculated, or less than the calculated no-shows. And uh, yeah, you end up uh, sitting in Frankfurt for a day or so until the next day. Uh, it was the last time I went through with the uh, Northwest. Okay. Um, let your current approach, going back to that, instead of the saga where I do all the things one after another, and then hence shaping my workflow, I have the chance to shape my workflow as I go. Um, I can do this the same thing, just uh, like with the asset transaction I would do that there. And that is, I just fire all these reservations at the same time without actually waiting for the result. I just fire all the reservations. That can be done very fast, and so my reservations get there earlier. And then, 
I just have a second phase where I just check the results. Did I get the, all these things? And if I did, I just book them. If not, okay, I think that's quite clear. Uh, reserve all the things, check all the things. One thing went wrong, I just give back all the reservations. Last thing, um, a little more difficult, no, not last thing actually. Um, more difficult transactions. A bank wants to send money to a different bank. Something like uh, such a transaction is a very serious thing, sending money somewhere. They want to make sure their money is not lost, <coughs> that nobody ends up with more money than they actually have the right to pull from the bank. That's the interest of the bank. And uh, with less money, that's the interest of not, uh, not with less money, that's the interest of all the customers. So make sure that all the money is transferred correctly. Still, <coughs> here is the bank, St. Frankfurt. Here is the bank, St. Frankfurt. I want to transfer money from here to there. Um, they don't do any asset transaction from the bank account in Frankfurt to the bank account in Tel Aviv. It even takes days for, for these messages to arrive there. How is it actually done? We cut these things into pieces. We have more than one transaction going on, each of them being asset transactions. But they are then overlapping, so to speak. The first transaction that I actually have here is, oh, stay here, one two-phase commit transaction, like debiting the customer account, bringing the money into a clearing account, and sending the money from the clearing account into an internet, interbank network, which is basically something like a transaction queue. And this is coordinated locally. If anything goes wrong here, locally, I will just go back and be in the state where I was before. And then the money is in the SWIFT network, which is actually a transaction by itself. Now this is transported through that network, <coughs> transaction matter. They even guarantee you up to a billion dollar per transaction that this works. That's how actually convinced they are of, their, of the nature of their um, transaction network. And then the third transaction was started. Now the bank of the receiver. Here in Tel Aviv. Okay, maybe not in Tel Aviv, maybe somewhere else because something goes wrong here. Same thing again, I just pull the money from that transactional network here, send it to the clearing account, and then from the clearing account to a customer account. And something goes wrong here, because I don't find that customer account, the account doesn't exist in that way, that account is maybe blocked, that account is not of that person, something is inconsistent here, so I have a problem. I will roll back. No. What will happen? I cannot roll back here in that sense that I have this um, st stick back into that queue. This is tricky one way. So I have a compensating action starting here. <coughs> I have to reverse what happened on that bank. I have to the money didn't arrive here. So it's still floating in the air, that money. And I have to do something with it but it has already left that bank. So that customer was debited. That compensator now starts a compensating transaction. This thing here, we can easily roll back. But we have to start the next transaction, which is a sub-transaction of this rolling back here, and stick that money back into that interact network. So it's, again, in real of SWIFT. Fourth transaction in that network, and then it arrives back <laughs> in the original bank, and the fifth transaction is going on, where I actually go through the uh, clearing account into that original customer account. So the money actually left my account for, say, two days. And I will, you will notice that on your account statement. 
the money was gone. That's how banks work. Of course, they could just say, it was our fault. No, it was not their fault or that bank. It was the fault of that bank. It's your problem that you lost money on the way. That's how banks work. So we have a, not a dis, one single distributed transaction, but overlapping transactions with transactional connections. Here, the Swift network. <coughs> Sometimes errors go away by themselves. Sometimes you receive a message, and you cannot process that message. Because currently, there's a deadlock in the database. <laughs> Can I get to that resource now? We'll get to that resource in a minute. So if you just retry at a later point in time, it will most likely be successful. This happens all the time. Can be some timeout, for example, also that uh, just <coughs> elapses when I, I want to wait 10 minutes for any transaction, but timeout is done, I will truly try at a later point in time. So, that is, and I have a few uh, conditions here, and that is the input must be repeated in this thing. Why? This self-healing thing here is, we work with transactional queues, we work with a transactional reading from that queue, and then we say, okay, if that doesn't work, we just roll back and try again. So this is transaction queue. And now we read from the queue and <coughs> give it that clearing account. Sounds familiar, looks familiar, that last slide. This is how it's actually done. I created this custom account. And if it works, it's fine. If not, if something goes wrong, I can just roll back that transaction, and since this is a transaction of here on that side, the message will just be sent back to that message queue. Left, or I should say, it's left there, and released. So, already in the original state. And then, at a certain point in time, I retry with the same message. Maybe now this works, because that log is released, and I have less load on the system, so my time will not elapse. Whatever happens, I can retry. And then I read that message again. <coughs> and what happens is, the error occurs again. And I have to look a little bit closer to that thing. And I examine that error and say, this is a repeatable error. This error caused by a dead mark. That can be the, I can repeat this any time I want. At, at some point in time, it will work. But, but then there are other messages. Messages that cause other errors. And will cause these errors any time I try to do this. For example, they will crash my system. An exception will occur while processing that. My system will come actually to a virtual halt if I would try to process that message over and over again. Exception will occur again, thrown back, I read it again, thrown back. System is busy 